G'day everyone, this is Jackson Milan, the Wealth Mentor, the Co-Founder and CEO of Aureus Financial. Sam Panetta, the Co-Founder and COO of Aureus Financial. And we're here with a special guest today, Chris Charlton of Charlton's Charters Accountants, who are based in the CBD and have been in business for around 37 years now, Chris. Yeah. Don't want to tell your age? No, I started when I was 14, so uh, <laughs> it's been a journey, yeah. So uh, welcome to another episode of Enjoy the Journey podcast, and uh, it's great to have you in the show. We've been trying to uh, wrangle you in for a little while, we've finally got you here. Yeah, yeah. So mate, thanks for, thanks for coming on board. Yeah. So mate, uh, as a bit of an introduction, talk to us about, about your business, what you do, um, who is Charlton's? Yeah, well I think as you said Jackson, I've been uh, doing this for quite a while, and uh, it's very much about... Um, really solving problems. Um, it's, all, it's all about having really good supporting people around you. It's all about uh, connecting clients with people that are credible, trustworthy, and we tend to road test everybody we recommend, which is, which is good. Uh, we concentrate mainly on the tax work, that's SME space, uh, but like the variety of um, clientele we, we have and we look after from you know, executives right down to uh, mums and dads, uh, we sort of like the whole family aspect, so you're often looking after mum and dad who might be in a latter stage of their career or looking at retirement over the hill there, but the kids are coming through and they want some information about tax and how to properly invest. Um, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, we, that is very relevant to people. Uh, we try to actually uh, inform and educate people as what they need to know. Uh, but of course, if clients just say, look, we want you to tax return, do a good job and you know, comply with all the rules, we're happy to do that. Um, so we just like to really be there to um, assist them wherever possible. Um, I, th I think that, that people often have uh, issues or problems um, with money or finances. Mm -hmm. uh, we often identify problems that they don't have got. But I say to all my staff and everybody I've worked with, uh, you know, never identify a problem until you have a solution straight after it. Yeah. So we're very much... Um, uh, situation where you say, look, you know, you've got a bit of an issue, but we've got a solution for you. And I think that's the thing that the clients want to hear. It's not, you know, they, they may know they have a problem or they don't know how bad it is. We've got a way to work through it, a solution or something they haven't thought of. Uh, it's good. The other thing too is enlightening people so they can actually help themselves. And we don't um, take over. We say, right, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So it's a little bit of an objective critique. Um, uh, I always say the best skill we can have as advisors is to be objective. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not objective, you're pretty useless. Um, so uh, you've got to, be able to look down and say to somebody, well, yeah, you're not quite doing that okay, but here's a way around it. So you, you, we're never negative about things. We, we tend to look at ways that people could be doing things a bit better. Um, and occasionally we've said to people, um, look, have you, you didn't really think through why you want to make that decision. And that might be a decision to, to start a business even. We say, is it the right timing for that? Um, superannuation is another one where people um, uh, get excited about that. We say it may not be the right thing yet. Let's talk it through. So. We're always going to agree with everything that our clients say. We just try to guide them in the decisions that's right for them as a, as a, as a business or as an individual uh, and a family. And what's really interesting, mate, and the thing that I really like about what you've created in your business is that I don't think that the term accountant captures exactly what you guys do. Because I think most people, and particularly small businesses who are watching this or listening to this, as soon as they think of accountant, they think of their tax returns and their VAS statements and, and all of these, these things to do with, with the ATO, basically. But what you and your team do so well and you're experts in is really small business problem solvers and, uh, and, and problem solvers for people that come to you with a particular scenario that they're probably, as you mentioned, very excited about. And then you're able to filter through, I guess, the, the emotions and the, the, that kind of excitement to help them make the best possible decision, which is, is, a, is a really important thing. Yeah, it's great to be excited. I mean, I love people that are excited about a business idea. Uh, or they're passionate about an idea because they thought about it, they've discussed it with their partner, um, they've drawn diagrams, they've gone on the internet looking at <laughs> stuff, they're all excited and, and you go, that's great. And enthusiasm is one of the best, uh, if you like, foundations for success in business. You've got to really be enthusiastic. What you really need is somebody to say, that's great, let's actually put that in a perspective, let's be a little bit structured about it and how's it going to work and have you thought about these things. And a lot of people you know, think about the end of a long day, they're going to you know, be multimillionaires, but they haven't thought about the journey along the way which involves a little bit of structure, a little bit of, you know, okay, boring stuff and a little bit of compliance stuff and, and all those other things and how, how you're going to play with the ATO, how you're going to play with, the, with, the, with banking, with finance is all very important. Uh, yeah, the term account has always been a funny one. Um, I'm trying to think of a better term. The best I ever came up with is, is financial navigator. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that sort of works, but that didn't ring any bells for anybody, so I just sort of parked that idea. But okay, stick with account, people know that, know, know that term. So, uh, yeah, what you really are, what I think we are there is, 
is just navigating people through the mm. through their journey and um, making sure that they are aware of what things might be over the hill, uh, what things are there. So that's the experience part. And you've seen a lot of these things before. You can say, well, look, um, you know, this is the type of things you can trust. This is how to pick things. But then it's all about cash flow. Mm. Um, it's all about having that uh, cash flow, having reserves, having access to those things. Um, I often said to, to, to uh, our clients and the staff say this as well, um, you know, best time to go and visit the banks when you don't need the money. Mm. Um, <laughs> you say, look, I've got no money, you know, I, I can't pay the bills. So the bank's going to go, oh, I'm really sorry. Look, uh, it's time for my golf company. Really. Um, whereas, um, you know, if you go to the bank and you say, well, there's great businesses, you know, reasonably good structure. I'm thinking of expanding. I've got this plan. Most people don't have a plan. Mm. I've got this plan where I want to be. And therefore, if I uh, achieve these, uh, these goals, I want to participate with some financing. And that's when the bank should say, that sounds great, let's go through it. Um, it's a better way to actually be structured. And often you find that um, you probably don't need as much uh, financing as you think sometimes. Yeah. Um, other times, uh, I always, again, in the decision-making, you say, I want to do something. I always say to people, if you want to make a decision about um, growing your business, expanding your business, make the decision on the assumption that you have the money to do it. Mm. Okay? Now, that's the hard part, because they say, right, I've, I've got this great idea, find me the money, Mr. Account. Uh, and that's okay, um, but I think if people make decisions by saying, oh, well, I can't afford it, or, you know, where am I going to get the money for that? They make really crap decisions. Wrong mentality. Yeah. Wrong mentality. Yeah, you just got to think, okay, I, I'm, I believe in myself. The one person you always believe in is yourself. You believe in your family. You believe in, in those goals you've got, those things that you've, you know, probably slaved away at university or trade school to get. So I'm going to believe in myself. Now, if I really wanted to, you know, achieve great things, what would I need to do that? Once you work at those things that you need without having the, the negative influence on you about, you know, what if I can't get the money? You make great decisions, you go on the account, you say, this is what I want to do. And you say, right, okay, now on assumption you're getting the money, that's a good thing. And people make brilliant decisions if they don't actually pollute their minds with uh, worries or negativities. Mm. Um, and it's, I would say to the client, it's okay to do this, it's okay to dream, it's okay to believe in your theory, your idea. I'll put some parameters to it, not, not to be negative, but I'll show you some ways we don't get too excited. With it, but um, um, I think one of the words that's used that very much these days is a very important word. Uh, I know it's already used a lot of scalability. Mm -hmm. um, sure, you want to have you know, 25 uh, retail outlets all across Australia, let's start with one first um, and see how that goes <laughs> um, and, and work through it. Um, just an anecdote, I read something in the paper, so it's really interesting. You know, that 2XU, um, I probably haven't pronounced it right, the, uh, the, the company that actually makes those compression for athletes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few around, we all know them. But they had a very interesting um, case study uh, yesterday, I think it might have been the, the Herald, um, about how they started. And they started with a couple of guys who knew a bit about underwear for a start, it was really interesting. And they then, they, I'm not saying this for everybody, they had a niche, they said, we're going to actually only make this really high quality compression sport for them, only for athletes. We're not a fashion label. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So they really narrowed it down. But then they said, we're going to go uh, international as soon as possible. So they actually looked at going international as soon as possible. So they kept their niche, they kept their focus, they didn't waver from the course, and they became very successful. The second smart thing is, after they'd been in business for a number of years, it was really getting some momentum making money, uh, they said they really didn't need any more money. But we thought, let's just find out what's out there. And a couple of very you know, savvy um, investors came along and said, look, we'd like to you know, boost it a bit further. So they actually bought into the company. So they actually cashed out a little bit early on, done their idea, which is really awesome. And they just, now now they were contemplating a float about a year ago, uh, again, with proper amounts to pull the plug, it wasn't the right time. Mm. Cool, I'm, I'm there giving all these green lights and ticks and got my box of gold stars out. Um, and then they get to a stage where that flight might happen next year. And, um, you know, it's really interesting to see a company that's, that's picked a niche, picked a, a high quality product. So if you buy them, they're really good. But every pro athlete pretty much will look at these as, a, as an alternative. Not as well known overseas as they should be, but there's something heaps of the stuff. So I reckon that's. Uh, as the guys have just have stuck to their, their course, uh, listened to really good advice along the way, um, and done everything pretty much right. Um, and uh, yeah, all power to them. Good well, that's really important. I think if you're doing a few key themes, and I think that anybody who's listening and watching, hearing what, what you're saying, is it's refreshing that uh, why is it kind of talking about this kind of stuff, the, the, the dream and, and following your ambitions and all that kind of stuff? Because I think that most of the clients that I've spoken to, um, their conversations with their accountant are pretty dry. Hmm. And, um, and I think that for small business, I guess a lot of us have the ambition to grow from this dream, take, turn it into a reality, scale a business that's really successful. Um, and for some of us, it's about getting to that point where you can float your business or raise capital from investors and, and create this empire. 
Um, and I think one of the key points there is being able to take advice. Hmm. So in your experience, mate, for small businesses, given that most of our, our audience are, are small business people, what are the key things that they, uh, they should be taking on board in terms of advice or who should they be turning to for advice? Well, the first thing, they've got to find somebody that actually they have a, uh, a bit of a trustee. Mm. Uh, and that means you've really probably got to interview a few people. Mm. You just mm. can't pick the first guy. Um, that might mean, um, normally the way it used to be is you ask your friends and colleagues, you know, do you know a you know, good accountant or good advisor? And most of the time they'd say, no, next question. <laughs> um, you know, or, or, oh, my dad's accountant's all right, but he's 103 and now like, he hasn't got internet. I know I can't like that too, by the way. Um, <laughs> but um, I think you've got to... Get the right person, the right fit for you. And now it doesn't mean that the person's your age or older than you. You've got to say, well, there's a team of people. Um, are we going to resonate with those people? Uh, are they the type we want? Get some recommendations um, on them. And then uh, the person really should be somebody who's more interested in, in explaining very simply what the principles are, the few basic things you need to know, and then sort of guiding you through those. Okay, And that's the, often the structure. The first question you get asked is, okay, I'm going to start a small business. What structure should I be? Should I be a sole trader? Should I be a partnership? Should I be a trust? Should I be a company? What's the difference? And the difference is quite simple. Um, the more somebody complicates it, the less they actually know about it anyway. Um, so you keep it simple. And often you say to people, well, look, starting off, here are the important things. Um, you want to protect your assets. You want to actually uh, uh, reduce your risk liabilities. And often I say to people, um, if they're starting on small business, like the company structure is inevitable. Mm. But not right now. Let's give, give it a go. Let's stick the cross down and see how it works. Um, often, just being a sole trader for a period of time is actually fine. I mean, if you're in a quite a low risk type business, mm. often being in a, in a partnership you know, with your spouse or, or with a good mate or somebody works as well for a while. But you have a plan to say, what, at what point in time do I then have the company? At what point in time do I need to trust? Um, one of the things which I think is probably anti few accounts is that you know, don't run businesses in trust, right? Over the year. Lots of problems, okay? Um, you have your assets in a trust, but you run your business in a company. Mm -hmm. there is, uh, do you remember going to a tax seminar years ago where um, they're all very good, it's a good, good company, been there to a few of them and uh, you've got to keep, got to keep learning. Um, and uh, the first half of the session was great, it was about super funds and tax tickets, all, all really cool, went and had the lunch, came back, sat down, opened my book up, stage two. It was all about running a small business and trust all the complications in it. I'm like, oh good, I can leave now, I don't have any clients in this. <laughs> so I've got an early mark and, and the amount of stuff you needed to know and, and we've I only got a very handful of clients that have a business and trust, usually we've inherited them. Uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it just throws up a lot more compliance issues. So getting the structure right can keep the cost very, very low or modest. Um, clients need to know some sort of concept of what things are going to cost, but it's also by the same time, what are we going to get out of what's the end of the, you know, what's the thing? Now, sure, compliance, you've got to comply. You've got to actually lodge the best statements. You've got to, you know, file tax returns. You've got to do financial statements. Um, as boring as that sounds, you have lots of spin-offs from that because if you actually get a really good set of financial statements too, that's going to be valuable for the bank for borrowing, even mm -hmm. if you're looking at money to buy a house. It's going to give you some type of street credit. It's going to give you some, some credit rating. It's going to give you some ability to uh, go to the next level, if you like. Um, when you have uh, financial statements that are actually done properly, and they're usually ones that are done on some type of a, um, you know, like a, a cloud-based software system, we, we tend to favour zero. We also very mild conversant. But with that information, there's some really good data there. You know? mm -hmm. and, and if you can get it coming to you in real time, like every time you make a transaction, it's there, then you can interpret that. You can say, what does it all mean? Um, you can do things about um, you know, cash flow projections or, look, I predicted that you know, I'm, I'm not getting paid quickly, what's going on and all of that. So um, an interesting story about that one is I had a, an advertiser, a very pretty good advertiser, I client many years ago. And uh, they got very excited. They were all you know, in the boardroom drinking champagne or whatever they were. <laughs> Thinking something anyway, um, and uh, I was the accountant. They're doing my thing for the day, and I said, "You know, they're all excited. Oh, yeah, great! We just hit, you know, a million dollars sales figure for the month or something. You know, first time ever." And I went, "Right." So I just gone through the figures with their in-house bookkeeper, who was who was terrific, and I said, "You've got a problem, guys." So I went, put the champagne glasses down, and said, "Your cash flow is blown out." I said, "You've been eating in your reserves. You've been um, you've got a, a big reserve account in US dollars. You're eating it as well. If you do not collect some money, you will be broke in a month." So let's get out there. So what they hadn't picked up, and we picked up for them, is that um, their clients, who are actually large multinational companies, most of them, decided to actually stretch the payment. So rather than paying them in 14 days or 30 days, they stretched it to 45 or 60, and they hadn't picked it up because they were so excited about the sales. Mm. And uh, you know they, they had you know, a couple of million bucks out there. So they all raced around, and uh, within about two or three weeks, they collected a fair chunk of money, and they were um, back on track. And I said, right, okay, now you can have the champagne. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, so, so getting excited about the sale, getting excited about the new customer, the new client, you want to make sure that the bloke's going to pay you. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some ways to, you know, often you do deals with people and say, well, I'll give you an extra time for you to pay, but you know, here's a few other ways of doing it. So um, understanding um, cash flow, understanding the structures you need, understanding the relationship you need to have with ATO or banks is it's just the basics. It's, it's you know, small business 101, what you need to do. And we've been about of being on about this all the time. So it's it almost seems to me that most SME business owners they don't understand these numbers. They don't understand their cash flow. They don't look at it. They they treat their accountant as somebody does their tax return at the end of the year. And for me to have that sort of attitude, it's almost like you're not taking the business seriously. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. if you can't understand your financials, and some people that they're fully blind to it, they don't want to understand it. They don't want to look at it. It's it's an amazing how someone like that can stay in business, let alone grow the business. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Do you see, Chris, with all the different clients, you've been in business for a long time, some characteristics of a, of a business owner, of a business that continues to grow and thrive and businesses that uh, are stale and they just they, they don't grow, they struggle all the time. Is there certain characteristics of each that, that replicate? Yeah, it's, it's funny without sort of upsetting many clients, but it tends to be the, the attitude of the of the client. Mm. The client often has this what great idea, it's the one great idea, and it's a bit like, you know, Lord of the Rings, you know. Um, <laughs> it's my precious, I'm a, and, and they don't allow it to, to grow. You've got to, you know, it's like a putting a tree in your backyard, a bit of water, a bit of fertiliser, sometimes I prefer fertiliser, up it goes. Uh, but the characteristic is they don't, they're not adapting to new change, new ideas, um, they, don't, they don't want to actually take advice. Now some, you know, Many moons ago, uh, when I first started, business had a really long growth. You had that sort of bell curve, which went for a long way. So you could really plot it easily. These days are much quicker. Sometimes you get into a business and it goes well, but then you've got to realise maybe I need to adapt quickly to get out. So the guys that tend to stay in business a very long time and have been clients of mine for a very long time tend to just sort of plan well ahead. Um, do things, simple things like SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and they go through those very, very, very carefully. So. Um, I always think to people go, well, you know, I'm conservative, I don't like to take too many risks, um, I like to really consider my decisions. I say, fantastic, come and see me, you're the guy I want. Uh, <laughs> I don't know too many lunatics with money that are wealthy. Um, so if you're very conservative and you really want somebody to plot you through the steps and you, but you take advice, you know, it's mm-hmm. so crucial. It's, it's okay, whether it's the, the doctor or the hairdresser or the accountant, they give you some advice. They're very well trained to give you that advice. They've really looked at it from an objective, you know, bespoke situation. Then you go in and don't take the advice. You go, oh, you know, I come back with this. The number of times I've heard from people, uh, you know, I saw you about this about five years ago and you gave me some really good advice. Okay, cool. I'm glad you remember back that far. I can't. Um, we didn't take the advice. Oh, okay. Yeah, we really regret it now because we've, business has, has gone pear shaped. Um, so, and you've got to probably sometimes know when to get out or sell or deliver on something different. Um, which is to say to the clients that probably still do this, there's the three hardest things to do in a small business. Um, ask for money, okay, say no and fire somebody. Um, so to get those things in place, because sometimes you employ people and we all love our, our staff. Um, but if they're really not the right fit or they're not working, sometimes that can create great detriment to your business. You've got to say they're not, not the right place for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, have a good contract with them. Um, Saying no, it's like, yeah, I'll do that for you. I'm not going to make any money out of it, but I'll do that for you. Like, no, no, no. And um, say, look, I did that great job for you last week. Was it really good? I did a great job, mate. Really happy. Can I get paid? Um, sure. Yeah, like people <laughs> that um, don't ask for that, that, that money. So I think it, it's getting good discipline early, creating really good habits early, listening to people that, that will give you advice that works. And you can tell it works because you get the advice, take the advice, and it works. And mm-hmm. uh, um, I, I was involved with a, with a client a few years ago. We gave him lots of advice. And the one thing I liked about this guy, he's become a, a bit of a mate too. He actually came up from Melbourne. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I would refer to you. I said, what, from Melbourne? He said, yeah, the guy really likes you. I said, oh, well, <laughs> one in Melbourne, that's good. Um, so he came up and uh, we gave him some advice and actually it worked out really, really well, everything he took. And at the end of a, his sort of journey where he came the other and made some money. So it was the one thing you learnt about business and the relationship. He said, patience. I went, cool. He said, be patient. Because sometimes you're looking at something coming at you and you just let it go past you. Don't confront it. Don't tackle all problems like, you know, uh, you know, like you're a, like you're a wrestler. And, um, you know, the fact that he was patient, knew that that was just a bit of a smokescreen or that was a bit of a bluff, 
and just work through it. So I think people that are very patient, very uh, um, discerning about figures, have the right people around them, and it's okay to change advisors. You might have the right person, and over a few years you go, yeah, not growing with me, not quite the right fit. Um, and you know, they said people pick accountants or pick advisors for funny reasons. I said to a um, somebody who's doing some really good high quality work for me once, I said, oh, you know, an accountant. I said, we're very happy. I said, no, good on you. I'm trying to finish the business. Great. I said, what you, I just want to know why did you choose that accountant? I said, they said location. Oh, okay. Where are you? Lane Co. Where are they? Crows Nest. Okay, it's very close. I said, uh, location was very important. Yeah. How many times have you been to see them? Never. I mean, oh, great. So it could have been in, you know, <laughs> all it wouldn't have mattered. So um, people choose accountants. I think the reason I went to this account was the accountants are actually quite good accountants. They were, you know, seem to be uh, very involved in the business, which I'm trying to say. So it's probably a, a long answer to a short question, but um, involving and realising, it's a bit, you know, like a car. If you've got a really nice car, you've got to get it serviced once or twice a year. You don't let it go because mm-hmm. the car's going to go on you, right? And you'd take it to a mechanic because I don't know when the last time anybody I know actually serviced a car. Um, but the mechanic's got all the gear, it's going to cost you money. But the mechanics are cool, okay? Like you take your car in for a service. It's always the dreaded thing, right? The car's going to go and reserve it. And the last time the service is about six, seven, eight hundred bucks. So you know you're going to be up for that. You've got the money ready to go. And you're waiting for that dreaded phone call because you drop the car up at seven o'clock and you get the phone call about eight thirty. Uh, here we go. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is uh, George from the repair service. Yeah, great. The shop stores are gone, or the brakes need replaced, and you know you're going to get that call, which and legitimate. I, mean, I think most of the things I've dealt with are actually pretty good. And uh, you say, right, what's it going to cost? And he says, oh, it's going to be you know, fifteen hundred bucks. You go, oh, bloody hell, oh, okay. So you know it's up to about two grand for the service, but at least your brakes are working. So when you take the kids away on camping on the weekend, you're not going to actually drop the side of the road. Mm. The work with is. Um, anyway, so but he tells you, so you go there and you prepare. Now, what happens if the guy? Uh, you turn up for the service with your 800 bucks and he says, oh, mate, I had to replace the shocks and you know, the brakes and whatever, and he's a bill for two grand, you'd be pretty un- unhappy. Mm-hmm. So the last aspect of what I told you the story is just communication. Be able to communicate very freely. It's okay to ask questions. I mean, the definition of the silly question is one you don't ask. Mm-hmm. So if you don't understand something, your advisor, your accountant, your plan or whatever says to you, just say, I don't really understand it. Can you please explain it to me? If the guy can't explain it, it's not your lack of ability to listen or understand. It's his inability to explain it properly. Mm. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to explain things to people in a manner that they get. So and that's really interesting, mate. I think that this is a really uh, sharp contrast of this kind of new age, old age accounting. Mm. Um, and I think a, a number of the themes that you've spoken about today, are, that there are people out there that create complexity just for the sake of it, for their mm. clients. Um, same thing in our industry as well. I think um, it's across the whole of financial yeah. services. But I think people don't know what they don't know. And, and they put a lot of trust and faith uh, sometimes for the wrong reasons, whether it be that they've chosen because of location or through a recommendation. Um, and and some, some people have been taken advantage of and, and have structures and things that are set up prematurely. And further to that, I think that there are inefficiencies in this kind of old age uh, professional uh, relationship where a lot of clients will pay for the service when they use it, similar to that analogy. I, I know how many times I've put off my service um, because I'm like, ah, oh, I know I'm gonna get stung let me push that back a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not a good thing. And it's that inefficient relationship where I'm paying as I use, um, so therefore I have the control. Whereas in in the best case scenario, assume that I was in some type of ongoing arrangement with my mechanic or my professional advisor, I'm already paying it in small increments throughout the year, I'm gonna be chasing value. And then because I'm paying it, the professional is gonna be like, oh, I've got to deliver value, otherwise I'm I'm not gonna be able to retain this long-term customer. I think this is the changing dynamic of what the new age accountant, the new age professional advisor is morphing into, but I think is only going to do better things for the clients moving forward. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I, I like the term, I like the new age, old age. It doesn't mean that old age is bad, new age is good. It means that there's a different way of thinking, there's a different way of approaching things. And mm. uh, uh, whilst we still have a lot of um, <coughs> probably items of advice that are constants and, and won't ever change, mm. um, uh, because they are still effective today as they were years ago, um, some of the new 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 rage things is you really got to get more involved with your client. Your client's better informed. Your client's got ability to actually do more things that you ask them to do. The, the software, the interpretive software, the information is, is far better than it ever was, uh, which is terrific. Um, one of the constants I like, and, I, uh, and this is very important, um, is there's a couple of very powerful forces when you're in business or when you're actually giving advice, and one's more powerful than the other. And the least powerful is is um, is uh, you know gut feeling. You know, you're a guy and you've got a gut feel. It's easy to like, you've got a gut feel. You don't like to look at that bloke, you look at the chicken. Okay, you're right. Sometimes <laughs> you're right. I don't actually go ahead with that transaction 
just got this sort of, you know, uh, gut feel about it. I think it's cool. I say to people, if you don't feel that comfy, the same goes with choosing an advisor or, or a bank or whatever, yeah, just don't do it, put it on side. It's the universe telling you to back off. The more powerful force is, is women's intuition. That's really scary stuff, right? Women are much better at this than guys. Women look at something and they'll go, yeah, I just think that's that's off. And the bloke say, oh, it looks a bit harsh, darling. You know, that's, that's a really, you know, it's not so bad. So women tend to pick up things that aren't quite right. Now, it doesn't mean that everything you look at skeptically, you don't sort of go in with the, the clay of the garlic and the cross to ward off the vampire <laughs> thing. But um, you've got to, I think, yeah, you, 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 as, a, as an adult, you're a smart person. You, you've trained, you're in business. Uh, your skill set doesn't involve tax and compliance and accounting, thank goodness. Um, I'm a pretty terrible plumber and electrician and uh, whatever. Um, call me old Blackfinger in the garden as well. Uh, I'm to kill stuff rather than say. Um, but if you use your intuition with your customers, with your clients, or choosing your advisors, yeah, you go, yeah, I like the look of this guy, and he seems what he's saying is fine. You go with that. Now, that might change. You might find that after a period of time, you're not real happy with it, or the type of service wasn't what you expected. Then say, you know, I'm just not happy with the level of service. Talk to the person. The person might be listening and aware that you're unhappy. You might think you're happy as a client. Mm -hmm. um, but if you still don't get that right type of vibe, okay, time to change. Ask somebody else to move on. Um, I, I think we're all looking for value. We're all looking for somebody that can provide you know, a really high quality of service um, uh, for, for something that's competitive uh, price-wise. But I think you've got to, you know, the old saying, spend money to make money. You've really got to mm -hmm. invest in your future. Investing means investing in those right structures, investing in the right advisors, paying the money, um, reassessing the value, because I'll say to clients too, I'm gonna to charge you X dollars to do something or we have an arrangement. I say, let's have this talk in a year's time. A year's time I go, you've had a year with us now. It's, it's we've, we've good, we've done some things, we've, we've you know, hopefully achieved or exceeded expectations. What do you think? And they go, really good. And therefore, we never talk about the finance because they're actually quite happy with That's the results. The they see mm -hmm. the value there. So, and I've had clients on, on uh, systems whereby it's been run retainer systems and actually we reduce the retainer in, in the future purely because we've achieved what they wanted to achieve. It's often a scale of growth. We've had companies that started out and they really just can't afford a, a full-time accountant or tax guy. So the idea of a CFO mm -hmm. um, or virtual CFO, sorry. And so you, you take on that role, you, you mentor them, you go to meetings, you talk to the directors even going. After a period of time, you say, look, you're making some money, guys. Now's the time to actually employ that full-time CFA because your business is big enough, you've got you know, X number of staff. And in doing that, uh, you put somebody in there and then you can you know, reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. Having said it, more likely in the new age is that you're finding that um, a lot of companies that have um, a lot of financial departments are actually reducing those departments and deferring more to the internet. So depending on your client, uh, often they want a human there to appoint them, a bigger company definitely. But those smaller businesses are saying, yeah, you know, we don't really need this whole level of structure. What we need is a specialist, but somebody who can also do the basic work. So with Charlton's, we have a whole bunch of people that can do different things. We have people that can do compliance work, people that do uh, you know, bookkeeping, accounting, um, our statements, whatever. Uh, we all work pretty much together because it's all in the same system. Um, and uh, we talk a lot. We sit down and collaborate and say, you know, how's Mrs. Bob's going over here or what's her business doing there? So we keep on, on the ball of things. We all know that if there's a, you know, an urgent question on some matter, they know who to talk to within the office. And yeah. there's about 15, 16 of us uh, or so. And we tend to sort of cover off those things. We, we have no hesitation in deferring to another expert, uh, a bit like your GP, I suppose. <clears throat> but if something comes up that is pretty tricky, I'll, I'll always have a crack at it. I'm, I'm pretty right with it, but I'll, I'll give a second opinion occasionally. We have a thing in the office which we call the 100% rule, okay? Um, the only advice you give a client, you'll be 100% confidence right. 99% doesn't work. If you're not 100%, I like that. Give the advice. Mm -hmm. And if you say to the client, I'm not 100% with this, but this is where we want to go, um, we can give you some more time to, you know, like, you know, phone a friend. Um, and, uh, you know, the number of times that, that we say to a client, bear with us, we'll come back to you. And the client appreciates that because they, they, get, they don't want 99%, because that 1% might be the, the, the arrow in the Achilles tendon there. Um, so, again, we have to really make sure that the client's coming to us, we have to be right all the time. Yes, we are right all the time because we won't give the advice once we are. Mm -hmm. that. So I think that's really important. I think there's a lot of people out there that give wishy-washy advice. Mm. Um, I, I've heard a number of horror stories, and I'm sure Sam as well. From just incorrect advice, it's not wishy-washy, wishy -washy, yeah. just wrong. That's the, do you yeah. know what I mean? Just fully false stuff. And, and in small business is so detrimental. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think that a lot of small businesses fall into this trap where they're trying to do a lot of this stuff themselves to keep their costs down. 
and they might be seeking advice, but the, the advisor may only have a very small piece of paper. <coughs> um, and that's a good segue. In, in, in your experience, mate, I, I guess we see a lot of these clients that are doing their own bookkeeping, um, trying to prepare everything in preparation for tax to try and minimise their in-house costs. Um, and we, we've seen in the past that there's typically always errors. Um, it's not it's not their, their, their forte. Mm. Um, and, and in turn, it always creates inefficiencies. So in your experience, Chris, I guess for small businesses, what, what would you, uh, I guess, advise them or, or recommend in regards to you're in a small business, you're doing some good things. Um, should you outsource these types of things um, or should you keep it in-house? Well, I think you get to a certain stage where you should outsource. Um, but in the early stage, like I've got a referral to from a, from a young guy starting up as a barrister. You know, he's obviously worked very hard to do that. And we said, look, we can help you with software. We can help you with the type of software you need. But I said to him, you probably don't do that straight away because he told me the type of turnover, he's expecting the type of transactions. And he said, look, you can probably just document that. So he's probably just documenting sending out maybe one or two bills a month yeah. that, and, and maybe having half a dozen expenses a month. So you really don't need to go out and invest heavily in software for that. I also told him in the chambers he was going, they have a clerk of chambers, what clerks of chambers do is they actually do those things for you anyway. So don't spend the bucks with us when you can actually have it done as part of your, your chambers fees. Um, but I think once you get to a certain stage where you look at the time aspect, I mean, if you're going to be spending, you know, Sunday afternoon doing your books to save, you know, a couple hundred bucks, I mean, I'd much rather be, you know, watching the footy or, you know, playing with the kids or whatever, or the grandkids or whatever. And, um, uh, and you know, as Jackson says, that most people do their own books, don't get it right, they absolutely stuff it up. So you end up going back and reading, you know, I've had a number of examples where the clients walk in with all the books done and say, oh, they're all the books that she did perfect. I spent you know, the last two weeks doing them. I'm great, you're going to bore him off. <laughs> um, look at the books, and, and I've said to the staff, the guys in the room, I've said, no, we've got to start again. We've got to start again. We have to end up charging more to actually go back to scratch, get all the source documents. So the, the amount of really high quality software that's out there at the moment, um, and look, a typical client that wants to actually go into a, a cloud-based system, which is really the only thing that makes any sense these days, uh, we will guide them through that. We'll set it up for them. We'll tell them what they need to do. Uh, if um, you know uh, the, uh, the the main breadwinner partner says, "Well, I'll help you with the, uh, I'll do some of the clerical work," which is terrific. Um, you can show them things they can do uh, that makes it a little bit easier. But you know, um, it's almost like um, when people get the knowledge to do their books in a, in a big, big you know, spreadsheet or something like that, um, even with Excel. Uh, we'd always say to them, look, you've got to have a, a, you know, we used to call it the NFI column, but um, it's the I, the I don't know column. And we look at the set of books and they say, everything's been properly allocated. And you say, well, what's in their column? And that was the, the sundries column, that was the better word. Nothing. Well, it's impossible. You always know what's wrong because anybody that's doing their own book should have a bunch of I don't knows. Because that tells us they really don't know, and therefore we can fix it. If they have nothing, you've got to find out where all the I don't knows have been shoveled and they're usually in the wrong spots. Now, when you have modern software which is online, it's, it's almost impossible to stuff something up. Mm. Because if something doesn't really quite resonate, the accountant or the advisor will actually pick it up, it's in real time. It'll go, ha ah, ah, that's wrong. Or they'll send a message through, look, I'm not too sure whether to apportion this. I, 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 want, um, I went to Bunnings and I spent some money on this. And, well, that's definitely business, that's more of a private thing. Here's how you do it. And over time, people get used to the fact that um, it takes minutes, done, finished. Um, so really, I think as soon as possible, if you go into business, if you get serious with it, you've got to actually you know, get your bookkeeping outsourced uh, to a really quality software system. Again, most people are using things like Xero. We really like Xero because it's actually easy to use. And then the benefit of Xero, it's all done. Um, it can actually keep your fees very sort of modest over a period of time. So you actually know what you're up for. You can pay this monthly amount and it's done. And it often includes, in our case, uh, the year-end financial, so there's no surprises. Um, and um, hopefully a refund as well. Um, and then with the information there, it gives the accountant or the advisor some ability to say, now we've got your raw data, let's actually give you a bit of a session on what it all means. And more and more people are saying to us, yeah, let's tell us what it all means. You know, what are the, the two leaves at the bottom of the teacup mean? Um, and you can predict a whole bunch of stuff uh, from looking at uh, financial statements. And it's that discerning eyes. Again, like if you're a really good, you know, uh, builder or tradesperson, you can walk into a place and say, oh, yeah, they put the wiring in the wrong way there, or that's that's wrong. I can tell it's an intuitive thing there. Mm. And with us, it's the same. We look at the financial statement and say, oh, what the heck's that? Um, we can pick stuff up that you'd never even see um, uh, and really correct a, a mistake, or in fact, say, that's a really cool thing. Or did you realise that, that your sales of this type of product has gone up and this one's gone down a bit? Why don't you, you know, shift the marketing over there? And that's the other point too. Once people actually have a bit of a role and they need to actually outsource 
other things like um, like things like marketing and, and, and you know, social media and stuff like that. They need to actually have professionals in there. You've got a professional website, don't do it yourself. It's great like the, you know, the guy on TV, yeah, it's really good. Nobody ever goes there. Um, but if you actually have people around you, and they're usually the source of finding the people, you say to the accountant, hey, really happy with the service, do you know a good? Yeah, we do, okay? Um, because the whole idea of any practice, any good practice, is you have a reliable source of contacts you can refer people to that you've tried and tested. And by saying to somebody, I go and see uh, uh, Kate because she's really good, um, I'm putting my reputation on that. So Kate is really good, fine. All I went back uh, from you is one day say, I went to saw Kate, she's awesome. That's great, but that's a road test. I can then say to somebody else, hey, a few of my clients will be like this person, and so on and so forth. So it's a matter of, um, uh, you know, outsourcing, I think, when, when as soon as you can to your bookkeeping work. Freeze up your time, you can focus on your goals, you can focus on your plans. Uh, I'm sure that's something that's been used in the session before, you know, working in your business uh, or working on your business, if they're not working on it at the minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and really, if you're working really, really hard, like I'm sure most people are. You know, you want to have a bit of, bit of me time, a bit of relaxation time, a bit of family time. You know, you're spending weekends wrestling with paperwork, you know. I um, can't think of anything worse than doing bookkeeping. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty solid trying, but if you've got a good software system, it's really easy. Mate, you, you've achieved a lot of success, right? You've been in business for a long time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started, your journey, and some of the, the the biggest obstacles you've had to overcome from the day you got stuck into it yeah. to where you are today? Yeah, I think the first thing was, and things have changed a bit these days, was, was the fact there was not much information about, there wasn't a, um, uh, you know, we didn't have the internet, okay? And now that wasn't that long ago, guys. But um, So the source of information, you went to, went to university, you did a degree, got your information. Um, there wasn't a lot of ways you could learn about things. You, you know, there's that stereotype, you're an accountant, hi, you're coming to see me as an accountant. Um, so I had to learn more. And what I want to learn more about is how to interact with people. I want to learn more about marketing. So I, 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 I got a lot more seminars. But actually, I gave a lot of free seminars just because I wanted to road test some of my ideas. So one of the first impediments was really being on my own, which is a lot of me. I had a virtual um, secretary once. Now, that'll surprise you because they've only just been a new thing. But I'll tell you about my virtual secretary. I had this office in North Sydney. Uh, and I was doing local work. So I was working for other accountants, and that was all cool. So I had this little, little office and I had a room at the back and there was a door and at the front there was a desk and uh, there was a vase and a flower. And there was a typewriter. Now nobody probably knows about typewriters. You used to have them once. They were really just the cool things. I mean, probably the one I had. It was probably in the powerhouse museum now, anyway. Um, I have it down there, some papers and pencils. And um, my landlord was in the suite next to me. And after about you know, six or seven months, he said, uh, how's it going? Oh, I've got a good business as well. Yeah, fine. We couldn't advertise on those days either, by the way. So it was just word of mouth and... You know, whatever. And he said, oh, you know, you've been here for all this time. He said, I've never met your secretary. And he said, oh, look, I'll, I'll introduce you to her one day. Another six months later, so I've met her. Oh, look, you know, I'll get, the, I'll get her to talk to you. I didn't have one. <laughs> it was just the fact that there was a somebody come in and say, you know, ring the bell. And so I couldn't have even afford a secretary. Um, <laughs> but as you learned that you, you know, we could do a bit more advertising, you get out, out there. Um, it's almost like most things, if you do a really good job, um, and there's value in that job, people rec recommend you. So the, the, big, the first impediment was just actually getting some clients in uh, and uh, really, I mean, I started when I was 26 um, and uh, it was funny because I thought, uh, so, so I grew a beard um, and my wife said, what are you growing a beard for? I said, well, I look a bit older. And uh, when I finally sort of got rid of it, um, about when I was probably early 30s, uh, the guy looked at me, one of my clients been with me day one, he said, Oh, how old are you? I said, about 30. So I said, when we came in, you were 26 years. He said, oh, I don't know that wouldn't have come to you. <laughs> so that's why I read it here. Um, <laughs> uh, but in terms of a real serious one too, is it's, um, I, I found that, and again, without, you know, I think this is one of the really good reasons to have something like Aureus in your team, is that I think the, the biggest impediment to people with businesses is it's been, most of the past has been banks. Okay, if, if anybody's going to really cause you grief in your business, they won't be the tax office. Um, they're actually not too bad. Um, it's, it's the finance. So getting the finance wrong is a massive impediment. So in my case, um, I had to start off at ground zero. Um, getting my first home loan was a, a bit of a chore. Um, and you learn about bank loyalty. It sort of doesn't exist. Um, and uh, I'd been with the, I think the National Bank for Yonks. And I went and saw the guy try to get a home loan. And he looked at me and he actually laughed. He said, you've got no savings? I said, but I've got a good salary. I've got a home business. No, go away. So I rang up someone I knew and he said, I'll go and see old mate, you know, Tim down at the, the state bank at Double Bay, look after you. 
میدونی نه دوباره سایت کرده و باه. و اکنون این سریه من نه وارد زدم همش دیوان تالی دام دل. Okay, this is really interesting. So it's, it's quite often sort of surrounding yourself with good people that can, can direct you. And I think the, the thing that I I succeeded and, and, and worked out well is just listening to people and taking advice from somebody that probably knows a bit more about a topic than you do. And that's really cool. And I still challenge the advice. Uh, but just over time, I think it, as I said, the patience is that it's growing, is working with your clients. Um, and, and in a way, if you're doing the right thing, you're retaining clients. I mean, I've got some clients I've had for you know, over 30 years, uh, which, is, which is pretty good. Um, uh, it's funny, I had one guy who was my, I was just his number one client, my first client. He's done the same, actually. Um, and uh, he, he left a few years ago because he was only semi-retiring and like that. But I had a couple of guys that uh, were, were partners that actually had a, had a record store, and they were quite a well-known couple. And um, they'd come in, and I'd, and they'd say, you know, we must be longest clients, so and they number two. <laughs> so about five, six years ago, this other guy moved on with his, with his new wife uh, to some advisory league or something like that. Um, they came to see me and I said, I've said, oh, just worked with you, been with me for you know, 30, 30 years. Long. So I said, now you're number one. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, number one's left. We're number two, now you're number one client. I thought that was the most exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but still clients. Still clients. That's, Over 30 years. That's a testament. Number client yeah. at 30 years. Yeah, they're, they're really good guys and, and you, you sort of, you, you know, you, you don't get that close, but you actually ups and downs in their life and... You draw upon the things that have um, caused them grief, um, but really, I think that this the, the successful part of what I'm doing is is having a bit of a focus on things. Yeah, you know, we're very strong on family values uh, and all that stuff are, um, and therefore you, you you're working hard for your family. But if you're working hard, go home. Mm. You know, I say to say to staff sometimes they're working back a bit of saying, "Well, you got a job for you. It's all finished, Mister. Go home. Go home to your family. You know, mm. you know, because most of the mistakes I reckon are made between like you know five or six o'clock every night. Um, but yeah, really, I think, I think tax office from time but the only times I felt very, very, you know, almost threatened or clients have been very threatened is when a bank has come up with some idea or notion and, uh, um, look, I'm sure there's some, yeah, there are some fabulous people who work in banking, some really nice, but we have clients who work in banks as well. But when that, when the guys upstairs, um, the faceless man with credit, um, that, um, you know, they say yes or no, there's nobody there, it's just like the, the, the little brick you know, the computer says no. Mm -hmm. And you've worked so hard all your life to your point and all you need is a bit of accommodation, they say mm -hmm. no, you're basically sort of screwed. Well, we've heard a lot of horror stories around this, right? And um, I think a lot of the, the undoing of a lot of these great businesses has been off the back of mm -hmm. the financing, um, either over committing, um, getting finance when they otherwise shouldn't have, yes. um, yeah. or uh, getting to a point to facilitate a, per a certain part of their growth trajectory, <coughs> getting getting declined at the very last minute, um, and uh, everything coming crashing down. Um, I guess it's one of those things that you just got to be cautious in business, um, and you've got to have the strategy. Um, you shouldn't be jumping into things feet first without mapping out the plan, knowing exactly how you're going to approach it. Yeah, and I think it's one of these things, right? So you know they're tricky, you know, especially uh, when it comes to business finance, right? That's trickier than all other mm. other types of finance. And I think uh, one of the things that, uh, especially you and I, the, the way we try to do it here at Aureus is, I remember all the, all the acquisitions that we're doing and all the things that we're putting into place to grow and sit down with the banker, Mr. Banker, what do you want from us to be able to fund us so we can do this? Well, we want this, this, and this. So we go away, get all that in place, and then try and go get the finance. And it's less hassles and less hurdles to jump over rather than saying, we've done this, this, and this, we want you to finance this for this. Correct. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, it does to me too. Another thing too, if you're looking at the, um, the older and newer account, which I still think is a good term, um, the older account was really very much the gatekeeper. He was the mm. guy that you come to, and he'd, he'd, he'd have a local bank manager with his mate play golf, you know, went out drinking on Friday afternoon when it was tax deductible. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> all of those things. And, but over time, things have changed, and we've had to embrace change. Um, I don't think the accountant is really the right person to necessarily get you the loan. Uh, the accountant's the person who supports the person who gets you the loan. So, yeah. something like Ori says, we can, we've, and it's a skill, it's a really, really, a lot of work you have to do behind that. So somebody like, like Sam would say, um, we're getting a loan for some, so uh, you know, get all the figures. So you, you go into the bank armed with everything. You've got everything sharpened, everything ready to go. So I, I like to fulfill the role of identifying a need or a niche. If I don't find your finances a bit stuffed here, 
here's a couple of ideas, but then you've got to go along and work for somebody else because the accountants are a great to interpret the money, but we don't have the contacts anymore like we used to. Mm -hmm. um, whereas somebody, you know, Sam and Oris, you have the contacts, you work on those on a constant basis. And uh, hey, don't be frightened to change banks. Uh, don't be frightened to uh, uh, to ask the question um, about you know, what type of deal you're getting. Um, we, we say to our clients, look, if you just um, want to get a, a, a no cost obligation review of your financial affairs in terms of your rates you're paying, and oh, but I've worked with the Commonwealth for 20 years, well, that's fantastic. What have they done for you for 20 years? Well, they gave me a money box once. Oh, okay, we've got some doors that can be popped. Get a check and have a Dollar look. Dollar was it? The Dollar Mite, yeah, yeah. You've got a, you've got a free money box. And uh, I remember when St George when they started, they gave everybody a pot plant. You know, grow with St George, really good. Yeah, they were actually a pot plant, guys. <laughs> yeah, that was a pot plant. Good sim symbol for the relationship. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, I think that, uh, yeah, if you're going to be brought undone at the worst possible time for the for reasons that don't make any kind of sense, Mm. It's going to be some peanut at the bank has come up with an idea that has no relevance to you at all. Like I've seen situations where, you know, back in the, the GFC days, and the GFC everybody was spooked, you know, mm. with their own shadow, but uh, a fairly notable bank in Queensland um, decided one day they weren't going to be in commercial lending anymore. Just wake one and say, we're going to have commercial lending. All their clients had paid the bucks, they had spent a lot of money in marketing into commercial lending. They pulled the pin, and we had a client, they pulled the pin, they were and said, oh, we're going to uh, call in your loan, can you pay it back next week? The guy said, but I've got a, a long-term contract, I've made a repayment, everything's fine, all the figures are good. Oh no, I'm going to call in your contract. And he went to check his life. I said, yeah, they can do that, because there's a fine print. This got to run around and try to find a lot of money very quickly, because they said, if you don't um, pay us, we're going to actually point receivers. And they just did. And we managed to pay pay the bank off by another, from another source within this very large family. Um, and get uh, receivers retired. It was just, it was horrible. It was just like, it's not what you want to be dealing with. Yeah, and it was like mm. the reputation of the bank was like that. Ah, we don't care, like it's just another number. Um, they're back in the market at the moment, sort of saying we'd like to do commercial loans. Yeah, yeah, no thanks. No thanks. Um, <laughs> so it's just, there are lots of, we won't go through them, there are lots of horror stories about how people at the point where they've achieved all their goals, they've, they've hit all their covenants, they've paid every interest payment, they've never missed a beat. Mm. And the bank says, oh, well, we're going to call them a loan at the moment because we want to do something different. Now. I even had one once, it was a horrible one, a personal one, where the bank branch, in particular commercial lending branch uh, of a Commonwealth bank, um, <laughs> <coughs> uh, the big elephant, yeah, right, um, they decided to close their commercial branch in a certain suburb. So by closing their commercial branch, rather than transferring the, the loans to a different branch, which is too hard, they just decided to call them all in. It was like ridiculous. And it was like, eh, don't care. Uh, we got we got that thing it was refinanced by, by a different bank. Um, it was funny. It was refinanced by the Bank of Queensland, based in Melbourne. How about that? Eh? <laughs> um, but that's the thing. So you've got to really predict or assume that you've got the right finance mix. Uh, but let's look at your logistics of what's required as mm -hmm. reserves. And the reserves aren't always having a good friendly thing with the bank. Reserves might be saying, "Well, I've got a reserve. I might have some assets. I might have some some debtors." Uh, these days, a lot of these smaller lenders that are lending money for, for, for deals, are, are most of them I think are very good. Um, you know, Sam knows a bit more about it than me. But, you know, the guy sitting there, he's got this really cool coffee shop all happening now in Colorado, he's going really well. And he decides he wants a new, you know, coffee machine. Mm -hmm. A new coffee machine is going to cost him 25 grand. So you need one that, you know, fills the time with the buses and the ferries and <laughs> makes sandwiches, the old man cooks makes it. Anyway, so he's got a couple of thoughts. He goes, hmm, I can ring up the bank. Don't do that. Right. Because he rings up the bank, he says it's going to get the computer, says no. So what does he do? Well, he'll, if he has a good relationship, he'll ring up and say, what do I do? Bingo. That's something where you can um, go into a uh, one of the lenders and they're all credible. And I'll say, look, you want a coffee machine, 25 grand, prove it within 12, 24 hours, whatever, 48 yeah. hours. That might be a loan where you pay back over six months or over 12 months. Awesome. Because with that new coffee machine, I can put the price of my coffees up by 20 cents or do a few more things to free up the space. So. A lot of these smaller lenders actually get it. Mm -hmm. They actually understand that. So having this combination of factors, um, and the other one too, which is really interesting, I've noticed with banks, that you say you're a, you're, a, you're a client, you've got three properties, okay? You've got three properties and they're all worth a million bucks each. You've got three million properties. And you want to buy a fourth property. So you go to the bank and you say, I want to buy this fourth property over here. Look, I have, it's a million dollars. I've got, I happen to have $300,000 worth of cash in the bank and I want to uh, I borrow $700,000 property. Please, okay. If the bank finds out um, that you've got three other properties, they want to take care of the whole, all of them. You go, why? Oh, well, they're all there, you know? So it's almost like if you can get away to say to the bank, no, it's only on that one there. 
and not take the other two into account. That takes professional, mm -hmm. takes somebody with a bit of strength to go and say to the bank, mm -hmm. no, you can't have that. And if you, if you, that's not good enough, there's a bloke across the road who'll lose business. A number of people I've seen coming in, they're saying, look, well, I've got um, I've got a million dollar loan. Look at their assets, they're $20 million. They're all income into the bank. You go, well, why would you do that? Oh, the bank manager said I had to. Right, okay. Um, well, this is risk management 101, isn't it? And I think mm -hmm. these kind of stories are, are good metaphors for, for small business uh, in, in any sense. But I think a lot of small business owners don't consider their risk management strategy as they go through their business journey, particularly when they're utilising uh, funds that are secured uh, from the bank. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's these types of things that we need to learn either through first-hand experience or from advisors who have the experience themselves to be able to warn you uh, and advise you so you can protect yourself. Because I think that a lot of people in, in those scenarios that you've, that you've mentioned probably couldn't have got themselves out of that situation if they didn't have the experience or if they didn't have an advisor to help them. And imagine what the repercussions of that would be. And it's so important, mate, because finance is one of these things, right, and debt in general is one of these things that there's no middle ground. It goes one of two ways. There's either people who have ruined their lives with debt, they've ruined their businesses, and, and they, they don't understand it, they're not using it properly. And there's the other flip side of the coin with people who understand finance and they get it, and who are using it to supercharge everything that they do in, in terms of you know wealth creation and, and business. And at the start, those, you know, person A and person B, they probably have the same understanding of what's going on, next to nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's typically down to which advisor they've picked, which steers them in the right direction and how they end up, which is a little bit scary actually for the consumer because if they're getting the, the advice from the wrong source, mm -hmm. They're not going to know straight away, but years down the track, they're going to run into a bit of grief. Well, too, with a small business, I think a lot of small businesses have to have what I would call a healthy level of debt. What that is depends on the business. But if you, if you come across a small business which is really thrive, a good business, they don't have any debt, you go, hmm, okay, there's something wrong with the picture because, um, you know, depending on the business, but most businesses need to sort of grow and expand. You have to have some understanding. So quite often, as I said before, if you don't really need the debt, work out the plan where you might be able to do things with it. Have a line of credit put in place, and then when it's there, you can, you can do it. As I said earlier, that you know, approach a, a financier or, or, or get a loan arranged on the basis that you don't really need it now. But if you've got a good plan, you will. If you want to expand, you want to you know, go somewhere else, or you might one day it comes up and you've been you're running stock, and one of your biggest competitors uh, contacts you and says, Look, I'm closing down the, the division, um, all the stock which is in, in the books of $2 million, you can have it for 100 <coughs> Well, if you get your line of credit, no problem at all. So opportunities can present themselves. You've got that line of credit to do that. So interesting. Um, pay cash for it by the end of the week. All, all of the above. So often having no debt, I don't think is a great thing. Having too much debt is clearly a bad thing. But having you know, a bit like the three bears, you've got to get the porridge right. Um, <laughs> too too cold and just right. Um, but yeah, I think you've got to have. And this is what Jackson, the risk thing. You've got to you know, talk to the client. What are my risks, and what do I need to plan for? And um, yeah, it might be something like I need to buy some more machines. I want to find some more staff. Uh, I might have, you know, I'll have a good year, I might have a tax bill coming up, or I'd really like to actually pay myself a good dividend in cash so I can actually use that to renovate the house. That's cool. Spending it on yourself is great. I mean, you know, I'd probably draw the line of the pink helicopter, but uh, you know, putting a new kitchen on an extension at the back, which is adding value, um, is a good thing. So having that sort of probably understanding or the dedication of how debt can be a really good thing, you know, good debt, bad debt story, mm. is really important. And, uh, you know, um, having a client with zero debt. Uh, in a growth phase of the business is usually like I'd say there's a risk or a threat. If they get to a stage where they're expanding and it's fine, then we just got to pull the plug of a big uh, debt that goes down the gurgler, which can happen, or people then push out their payments. You're screwed unless you've got that line of credit to, to shore it up and move to the next level. So having a very, very good risk management and debt strategy is so important. You've got to have that. Without that, a small business mm -hmm. just won't, won't grow and, uh, and thrive and uh, protect itself, really. And it's interesting. I think that a lot of the things we've covered up on today are a very different perspective than what most small businesses would have had a conversation with their typical suburban accountant. Um, and I think this goes to show that a lot of small businesses really need to reevaluate what they're what they're looking for from their advisor or, or team of advisors. So, Chris, in your experience uh, through through everything that you've achieved in business uh, yourself, uh, what you what you've been able to deliver in, in terms of being an advisor over these years. What would you advise small business owners uh, who, who are listening or watching today um, of what they should look for when they're trying to find the right advisor for them uh, and to be able to I guess, achieve the goals in their business? Look, I think it's partly um, 
uh, looking what the, what the relationship they already have with an account or advisor and just assessing it to say, look, it's, you know, it's scale of one to 10, is it a two or is it a six or you know, uh, whatever? Uh, <clears throat> nothing wrong with getting a second opinion, is to, to say, look, um, I don't really know if the grass is green on the other side of the hill, so um, get a recommendation or, you know, social media is quite good these days, go, go on the internet and have a look and say, this guy's good, there might be some reviews. And so look, I, I'm, I'm thinking of um, you know, uh, uh, changing accounts and looking at two things. What can you offer me? You go and have the conversation. It should be for free. The account will talk to you. They'll, they'll go to some of the facts and figures. If you walk away with some really valuable information and then you don't go ahead, that's okay. We're not worried about it. We don't have to chase every ambulance down the road. Um, and it really shouldn't be, I don't think, a, a sales pitch. I think certainly the account would like to do business. is going to spend some time with you to, to go through it. But you should say things to you or, you know, what, what are your concerns or, you know, what what is your account and currently you don't offer you do like and we get the same answers okay it's they're not communicative um, they uh, they don't actually inform us or when they give us the accounts they just say look sign send it back and see you next year type of thing mm -hmm. um, they want something that's a little bit more inclusive uh, yes they're prepared to pay for that if it's if, if they see the value um, so it's almost like you said your accountant just a compliance person just does the numbers wax a minute she's once a year and you know maybe get a Christmas card if you're lucky. Uh, or there's somebody that really has an interest in your business that you can say, look, I just want to to talk to you. And my view is for the for the you know risk of paying for a consultation, um, go have a talk you know, uh, and just say these are things that bother me or, or um, what should I be doing or can I, can I go through your business more? And look, for some of our clients, look, we'll have a talk and they'll just be part of the deal. I mean, they've been such good clients and you know I'm not going to charge every dollar I have. Um, and uh, I had a lady the other day, she hadn't really had a good chat to you for a while. So I said, well, are you happy with Oh, the service is great. You know, someone says, looking after my account. He's really good, it's been cool. I said, what do you want to talk to me about? She said, I just want to go over, you know, we've, we've been clients for quite a while. And we just had a good chat about things, put a little bit of um, perspective on stuff with her. And she walked away really cool. I call that process marking your homework. Mm. Most accounts actually, you know, black for mark, terrible, no good, could do better. I go and say, that's really good, that's really good. So you tick off the things they're doing right, mm -hmm. which focus on the things that they could be doing better. And you go, right, well, we've got an 8 out of 10, let's go for 10 out of 10, and you walk through it. So she walked away very happy with that. In the tyres, it's that chain. Well, mm -hmm. in a way, but I think it's good just to have that, you know, any accountant, irrespective of what they are, should be happy to have a, a chat to you on a, on a, you know, every now and again, talk about a few things. Um, and I think that um, you know, most accounts will have, uh, as we do, Probably get some type of a, you know, if it's a one-off fee thing or a retainer thing whereby you can feel like when you make the phone call to the account to have a chat about something, you don't hear the ticking sound in the background, which is the meter going. Um, <laughs> we also try to do what we call the, the, the how things, it's either a phone call or a visit. You know, just ring them up, good day, how are you going? Oh, what's wrong, what's wrong? No, no, no. See, how are you going? You know, no charge, just ring them and have a chat. And over a period of time, they might say to you, oh, yeah, look, I'm a bit concerned about something or other. You know, there's, there's a, there's the, and, and, one of the difficult words, it's a very difficult word, um, I've never really been able to um, come up with something that works for everybody, is, is the word proactivity. I think proactivity is badly used, generally by clients. I want accounts proactive. What does that mean? Well, they communicate with me all the time. It's cool. They say, but I don't want to pay for it. I just want something to cool. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a balance of there that the proactivity, if you've got a client that actually really wants to get ahead of their business, really wants to use your services, mm -hmm. um, you work out an arrangement with them that actually works. How many, how many businesses? What do you want to do? Um, I spend most of my time yeah, on, um, on emails, measuring emails. I mean, I clients, whether they're big clients or small clients, I'll send an email. You know, usually after the weekend, they've had a bit of a think around the barbecue with the sausage in one hand, the beer in the other. And they say, oh, but it's a really good idea. So I'll go back to them. The fact that we get back to them, the, the thing that most people say when they're looking at uh, changing accounts is that my accountant never returns phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, I got the bill last week, didn't know what it was. It was online, two professional fees, five grand. Oh, that, that would have really made your day. Um, uh, so I think it's a matter of if, if, you know, if, your client, if your accountant or somebody the accountant puts in charge of your affairs will ring you back and communicate. Because you've got a question, it's really important. That, that, you know, mm -hmm. It's not a dumb question. No, it's really, and it might be something simple looking to buy a car, what should I do next? That's fine, I mean, so there's got to be that, that service level. Um, so I think you've got to find an accountant that has some depth, is a good communicator. Um, uh, it's a bit of a given in a way, funny enough, that most accountants aren't quite, quite knowledgeable. It really is, I mean, whether you're a CPA or a chartered or a member of the NCAA or some other organisation, um, uh, those people have got their qualifications, they actually are knowledgeable, okay? Um, that's fine, but what you want is something you can communicate and I, I get feedback from clients people saying, yeah, well, gee, I've, I've learned more from you in the last, you know, I have a have some other accounts, well, thank you. But 
I was going through the things that you really needed to know, and you know things you don't need to know, you don't need to know. Um, so you've got to have that relationship with people. And, and I have um, lots of staff who, which have you know been with me for anything up to my longest staff is now eighteen years, um, and I've got you know a couple of uh, younger people who've been a year or eighteen months. Um, and the interesting part about it, I, I, I hire for them with communicators uh, wherever possible. Now there were situations where staff will say, I went and saw um, uh, George the other day. And he had a question, um, and I, I, I said to him, I think this is what you should do, George, but I'm not 100% sure, he rings me. And I, I've had calls from staff out and visit saying, this is a really interesting question, what do you think? Fortunately, 99% of the time, the staff member is absolutely correct, but the fact that they've said to the guy, look, I'm going to just you know, check. double check to make sure it's mm-hmm. right. And often that's with, with different costs and fees and how to do certain things and, and how to strategize or look at strategy. Um, but I say to a, a new client, if you want me, you get me. No problem at all. I'm not going to farm you out to you know, some new junior that's um, you know, just newly arrived. Um, I said, that's fine, any time. I mean, I'm going to be a little bit more expensive than somebody else, but that's okay. Um, and you know, really, I spend most of my day talking to people and, uh, and answering emails because it's actually fun. It's really, I still I enjoy it. That's what it's all about. And I think that from everything that we've spoken about, this is refreshing, I think, for most people who are going to be listening and watching. Um, and we know that we've experienced it firsthand. Of course, we're clients of yours. Um, and, and it really comes down to that communication and knowing that you guys have the answers. Um, there's been an, an, so many situations where we're like, oh, I'm not 100% sure how we navigate this. Let's call Chris and the team and, mm-hmm. and pick their brain. Um, and we know that if you don't have the answer, you know someone who does. That's um, and, and that's really what small businesses need. Um, so I think that this is hopefully very enlightening for everyone who's been listening and watching. Um, I think that the, the summary of all of this is that you need a proactive uh, advisor, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like somebody who's, who's able to communicate in your language to help you understand the complexities of, of business and, and your financial life. And if you don't feel you're getting value, um, you should be looking around just to, to hold your current advisors accountable to what they're doing to deliver value to you. Um, and look, you do get what you pay for. Um, you need to pay for good advice because good advice isn't cheap, but it is invaluable. It can make, make mean the difference between having a, a, a decent business and a phenomenal business. And, and the world's changing. What was a lot of value 10 years ago is not a lot of value today. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. the better businesses uh, in any industry are, are figuring out ways to give more and more and more value to their clients right. every single day. So it's, we have, yeah, Charlton's is definitely doing that. And um, so uh, for any of you who, who are watching or listening, uh, looking to, to get some more advice in your business uh, and, and basically take control of your financial situation to be able to achieve your, your business goals. Um, we'll include all the details for Chris and his team uh, in, uh, in the podcast and uh, I'm sure that they'll uh, be a, a tremendous asset to your business moving forward. So uh, Chris, we appreciate you coming Thank you. No, thank well, you for coming on. It's great. Been really a good, good chat and yeah. uh, shared some, some good war stories. Uh, so we appreciate lots. it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have you on again uh, to, to share some more in the future. Cool, that's great. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Really Thanks. good.